Okay, for this deep dive, you wouldn't believe the pile of uh, sources I've got here. It's like someone crammed every possible technical term they could think of right into this stack. But trust me, buried under all of this jargon are some truly mind-blowing ideas. I think we're going to find some really cool stuff here. Yeah, that seems to be the challenge, right? Sorting through all of the complexity to find the real gems of knowledge? Yeah, exactly. And today, those uh, gems revolve around this system, a system built around knowledge graphs. And there's also this kicklang. And kicklock. Kicklock, yeah. Which, I mean, come on, they sound like they belong in a sci-fi movie, don't they? Well, they do. But from what I've been able to gather, it looks like a system designed for research. Yeah. And maybe even automation. But there's this other mysterious element we see Kick mentioned throughout the sources. And it's not exactly clear what that is yet. But it seems to be some kind of guiding principle, maybe even a motto. Ooh, a mystery. I love it. So, to crack this case, we've got excerpts from these files, kicklang.txt and kick.template.txt. We also have a guide called uh, Kickney. Keep it concise and kicking. And we even have snippets of a conversation labeled System-L and User-L. It really is like trying to put a digital puzzle together. It is. And by the end of this deep dive, you're going to see the whole picture. Not only that, but you'll understand how these pieces might impact your life. Okay, let's dive in. First clue, this kicklang.txt file, it talks about something called kicklang, and it describes it as a formal language used by a research assistant system. Yeah. And what's fascinating is this research assistant can, it seems, understand natural language queries. Yeah. So you could talk to it in theory like you would another person. So it's like having a super-powered research librarian at your beck and call. That's it. Wait, really? I could just ask him, you know, find information for me or analyze this data and it would understand what I'm saying. That seems to be the implication, yes. And then the system translates your request into Kicklang which it uses to actually process information on a knowledge graph. Oh, I see. So it's like it's like Siri or Alexa, but instead of playing music or setting an alarm or something, it's digging through research papers and data sets. So Kicklang is, what, the secret language that it uses to talk to this knowledge graph? That's a great analogy because it really highlights how the system could bridge the gap between our messy human language and the precise language of computers. That's really neat. Okay, so what about kick.template.txt? This seems to be outlining a system for generating like actual content, mm -hmm. but with very specific rules. Yeah, you can almost imagine it like a recipe for creating text. You have these different mm -hmm. sections, context, const, and content. Each one has a very specific role in the process of generating content. So context would be what, like the background information, sure. and const is for things that stay the same, and then content is the actual, you know, the meat of the text. You got it. So like context could be things like the user's question or the topic being discussed. Const might include any fixed values or definitions. And then content is where the magic happens, right? That's where the actual response or output is generated. I see. It's like all of these uh, AI writing tools that are popping up, but this one seems way more structured and controlled. Exactly. Exactly. And that level of structure is really essential for automation. Think yeah. about it. If you want a system to reliably generate reports, summaries, or even creative content, you need those clear instructions and guidelines. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, what about this kick? Keep it concise and kicking guide. What do you make of this? Well, I'm still not entirely sure what kick stands for. Yeah. But it definitely emphasizes clarity. And efficiency. Yeah. Right, which are crucial when you're dealing with really complex information. It might even hint at the system's overall design philosophy. Like they're, uh, you know, a team having a work smarter, not harder kind of attitude. Right, exactly. Like get to the point. Make things happen. Yes. Which is exactly what we need when we're trying to learn something new. Like nobody wants to read pages and pages of jargon. Right. Just give me the good stuff. Exactly. Speaking of the good stuff, let's move on to this system and user old conversation. And this one is, well, it's unique. It's not your typical back and forth. It's almost like reading the transcript of the system thinking out loud. It is. Yeah. It is. And amidst all these really technical details, we see these interesting concepts emerging, like this process automation model, or uh, PAM for short. Mm -hmm. Think of it as the blueprint for how this system actually gets things done. And then there are these different roles that are being discussed. Right. And it's important to note these are not human roles. These are functional roles within the system. It's exactly. Exactly. It's like a play. And each of these roles is a character in the play with a specific job. So we see things like code generator, which uh, spits out JavaScript code. 
So you're saying I could just describe what I want a website to do and the system would just write the code for me? Well, that's the implication. Wow, that's that's getting into some serious automation territory. It is. We also see these Axios error messages. And these, I believe, represent failed requests, which tells us the system's trying to interact with, with other services, like maybe it's reaching out to the internet for more information or even trying to control other applications. So it's not just a research assistant then, it's like this whole ecosystem of interconnected parts all working together. It is. And that leads us to the final piece of the puzzle for this part the mention of Neo4j running. And that JSON data output with terms like nodes, labels, and properties. Cryptic. Very cryptic. Time for you to decode all of this. What do we got? Well, I'll do my best. Neo4j is a popular graph database, and it's specifically designed for managing knowledge graphs. Think of it like this giant interconnected web of information where everything's connected to everything else. Okay, I'm starting to see the connections now. So the system is using Neo4j to store and analyze all of this knowledge in the form of a graph. It's kind of like how our brains make connections between different ideas, right? You got it. And those terms you mentioned, like nodes, labels, and properties, those are the building blocks of a knowledge graph. A node could be a person, a place, a concept, anything really. Okay. And those nodes are connected by relationships, which have labels to describe what kind of connection it is, like is friends with, works at, wrote this song, something like that. Right. And then each node can have properties, which are basically just bits of information about that node, like age or location or genre, anything like that. You're picking this up really quickly. Oh, thanks. This structure allows knowledge graphs to represent complex information in a way that computers can easily understand and analyze. So if we connect this back to the research assistant, yeah. it's likely using Neo4j and this knowledge graph to, you know, answer our questions and perform tasks. It's like having a super powered research team at your fingertips. A fantastic way to put it. And it does raise some pretty interesting questions about the potential of this technology. Yeah. But we'll delve into those a bit later. Okay. So we've got Kicklang, Kicklock, knowledge graphs, PAM, ROLS, and Neo4j. Quite a lot. I'm telling you, my head is spinning. This is next level stuff. Yeah, it's a lot to wrap your head around for sure. Yeah. But I think once you kind of get the basics, it's like you can see this whole other dimension of the digital world. Okay. So we've got these two um, formal languages, Kicklang and Kicklock. What's the difference? They both just sound super technical to me. Well, think of it this way. Kicklang is focused on querying and manipulating that knowledge graph. Yeah. It's like the very precise language of search and analysis. Okay. Kicklock, though, that's more about communication and control within the system itself. Oh, okay, I see. So Kicklang is how the system talks to the knowledge graph, like digs through all that information. Right. And then Kicklock is how the different parts of the system, you know, talk to each other, like coordinating all the actions and everything. That's a good way to visualize it. Yeah. Kicklock also has this very specific format using keywords mm. that control the function of a sentence and natural language names used as embeddings. Embeddings. Now that sounds complicated. Well, it's really quite clever. Embeddings are just a way of representing words or phrases as as numerical vectors. Okay. So that computers can actually understand the meaning and the relationships between different words. Think of how Google suggests similar searches. Yeah. Yeah. That's embeddings in action. Understanding the relationships between words. Oh, that's interesting. So Kicklock is like this a uh, super efficient language then yeah. specifically designed for the system to like communicate and control all of its different components it's like giving every part of the system a walkie-talkie right with a special code language only they know i like that yeah yeah and remember that snippet about the kick lock messages having a very specific format yeah it also mentioned something about keyword combining two sentences oh yeah yeah does that remind you of anything um well, it makes me think of like programming languages, you know, where you use keywords to kind of connect different parts of the code and create this, this really complex logic. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It suggests that Kicklock isn't just sending simple messages. Yeah. But it's actually expressing really sophisticated instructions hmm. and relationships within the system. So it really is like a conductor leading an orchestra. Right. Making sure every instrument plays its part at exactly the right time. Okay, so we got these two languages, Kicklang and Kicklock, working in perfect harmony. Kicklang for talking to the knowledge graph, 
and kick lock for all the internal communication and control. What's so interesting is it's not just these individual technologies. Right. It's how they're all woven together to create something, you know, bigger than all the parts. Much bigger. It's like taking a bunch of Legos and building an incredible spaceship. But in this case, the Legos are formal languages and the spaceship is this system for knowledge and automation. Now, remember how we talked about that system, like automatically generating JavaScript code? Yes. That's where things get really interesting because JavaScript is the language of the web, right? So could this system then potentially be used to create or manipulate websites and web applications, like building websites with just your voice? It's definitely within the realm of possibility, I think. And if we consider the focus on these knowledge graphs, imagine websites that aren't just static pages anymore. Yeah. They're these dynamic and intelligent entities that can actually understand and respond to user queries. Wait, websites that are like living, breathing things, yes. learning and adapting as people interact with them, that's a whole other level of web development. It's a very interesting concept, yeah. And it's a real testament to the power of these knowledge graphs. They're not just about storing data. They're capturing those relationships and the meaning, allowing systems to actually reason and, and make connections in ways that we just couldn't imagine before. So it's not just knowing that this particular artist wrote that particular song. It's like understanding their entire career, their influences, all of their collaborations. It's like having a music encyclopedia come to life. That's a great way to put it. And that understanding can then be used for some really amazing things. Things like recommending music, discovering new artists, mm. even generating creative content. Wait, so you're telling me this system could like analyze a knowledge graph of music and then compose a new song based on the patterns and relationships it finds? Well, it's certainly a possibility. That's that's crazy. It is a pretty remarkable possibility. And it's just one example of how knowledge graphs are being used in these really innovative ways. Yeah. You know, they're finding their way into all sorts of fields, healthcare, finance, social media, e-commerce. They're being used to personalize recommendations, mm. improve search results, even detect fraud. Wow. Okay. So if I'm shopping online, then a knowledge graph could be used to recommend products to me based on like, you know, my p past purchases, my browsing history. Absolutely. Maybe even my social media activity. Yeah, that's right. It's like having a personal shopper who knows me better than I know myself. Exactly. And in healthcare, knowledge graphs can be used to analyze patient data, yeah. identify potential drug interactions. They could even help with diagnoses. It's like having a team of medical experts constantly working to provide the best possible care. Okay, I get it. I get why knowledge graphs are such a big deal. Yeah. They're not just some fancy way to store data. They're this fundamental shift in how we even think about and interact with information. It's like, you know, going from a basic map to a GPS system with real-time traffic updates. That's a great analogy. And as these technologies evolve, I think we can definitely expect to see even more innovative and transformative applications in the you know in the years to come so we've gone from like this mysterious system to this whole deep dive into knowledge graphs this has been quite a journey it has we've barely scratched the surface but let's take a moment to recap you know what we've learned about this system so we've got kicklang and kicklock these two formal languages working together to query manage and control this knowledge graph stored in neo4j and this whole system has the potential to you know automate research, generate code, maybe even revolutionize the way we interact with the web. It's like a glimpse into this future, a future where information is just, it's seamlessly integrated into our lives. It is. But as they say, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Right. The ethical implications of a system like this are, they're significant. We have to consider them carefully. But that's a conversation for another time. Okay, so one last question before we move on. We've talked a lot about these uh, these formal languages hmm. and knowledge graphs, but what about us? Yeah. Where do we fit into all of this? I mean, that's the real question here, isn't it? It's easy to get lost in all the, the tech stuff, but we have to remember these systems are meant to be used by people, by us. That's right. And it's not about replacing us. It's not about replacing human intelligence. It's about augmenting it. You know, like think of it as a collaboration. Okay. We bring the creativity, the critical thinking, the ethical guidance, mm. and the system handles that heavy lifting, all the data processing and analysis. So it's not human versus machine. Right. It's human and machine working as a team, like a dynamic duo, each one with its own superpowers. I like that. And it highlights how important it is for us to understand these systems. The more we know about them, 
the better we can collaborate with them. We can actually shape their development and make sure they're used responsibly. Yeah. So we're not just passive users. We're active participants. Yeah. You know, guiding the technology to do to do good. We need to be tech savvy and and ethically aware. I agree. Knowledge is power. Right. Yeah. And in this case, it's the power to actually shape the future. But let's get back to to the practical implications of all of this. You know, we said that this system can automate all sorts of things, yeah. research, data analysis, even code generation. So does that mean like humans are becoming obsolete? Are we all going to be replaced by robots? Well, I mean, it's a common fear, but yeah. I don't think it's a likely scenario. What I think is more likely to happen is, well, we're going to see a shift in the types of tasks that we as humans actually focus on. Okay. As machines start taking on more of the routine tasks, you know, or the, the really data heavy tasks, humans can dedicate their time and energy to the things that, that really require creativity and critical thinking. Yeah. And emotional intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the things machines aren't so good at. So instead of spending hours and hours poring over spreadsheets or writing, you know, repetitive code, we can finally focus on like the big picture thinking, mm -hmm. strategy, innovation. We can be the ideas people. Right. I imagine a world where you've got an AI assistant who handles all of the grunt work, like gathering the data, analyzing trends, even generating initial drafts. And then I can come in with a creative genius. That's right. It's like having a superpowered intern who never gets tired. Okay. I mean, that sounds incredible, but it also means we have to change, right? We have to, to adapt. Yeah, we do. Like develop new skills and, and really embrace new ways of working. Absolutely. Lifelong learning is just, it's going to become even more important, right? In a world where technology is constantly evolving, we have to be adaptable, mm. curious, and always willing to learn new things. So it's about staying ahead of the game. Yeah. Embracing possibilities. Yeah. And finding ways to use these technologies to to actually enhance our lives, our work, you know, everything. You got it. You know, remember those Axios error messages that we mm -hmm. saw yeah. in the system L conversation? Those failed requests? Oh, yeah. They really caught my eye because, well, they suggest this system isn't just a, a self-contained thing, you know? Mm -hmm. It's actually reaching out, interacting with all these other services, maybe even learning from external sources. Mm. So it's not just a brain in a box. It's yeah, plugged yeah. into like this whole wider world, constantly gathering information, expanding its knowledge. It is. And it, it raises another question. What happens when you've got multiple systems like this all interacting with each other? <laughs> what kind of what kind of behaviors might emerge from that? Oh, wow. Right. It's like a whole other level of complexity. We could have this whole network of intelligent systems sharing information, working together, maybe even competing with each other. It's it's like the internet, but with brains. It's amazing and, and kind of terrifying, isn't it? It's a thrilling scenario yeah, and a potentially transformative one, and one that we're definitely going to be keeping an eye on as these technologies continue to develop. Okay. My brain has officially reached max capacity for today. Kick lang, kick lock, knowledge graphs, the future of work. We covered a lot of ground. Yeah. And really, we've only just scratched the surface. Yeah. Hopefully, though, this deep dive has sparked some curiosity. Oh, definitely. Some new ideas. Maybe even a little bit of excitement about what the future holds. I, I'm definitely excited. This has been such an incredible journey. You know, we've we've learned about a system that could totally change how we research, how we work, maybe even how we think. But I think most importantly, it shows us that the future of technology isn't just something that happens to us right we create it together so keep exploring keep asking questions mm -hmm. and keep learning because in a world that's moving so fast knowledge isn't just power it's the key to to unlocking a future that's full of possibilities until next time keep those brains buzzing